Today, my friends, we're going to put on our electronic engineering superhero capes, our protective eyewear, of course, and actively reject stray magnetic fields with not a magnet in sight. Okay, maybe we don't really need the capes or the eyewear. We just need inductive position sensors. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Hall effect sensors have been quite popular for a variety of applications for many years. But inductive position sensors can provide better accuracy, better noise immunity, can cost less, and can reject stray magnetic fields. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Mark Smith from Microchip and I examine the multitude of benefits that inductive position sensors can bring to automotive, robotic, and industrial applications. And we also check out the easy-to-use kits that can help you get started using them in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about the role that position sensors play in actuators and motors today. But Mark, before we get started, what does an inductive sensor buy me as an engineer? What benefits do they bring to the table versus a hull sensor and magnet? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, the idea of designers are when they build sensors, the goal of inductive position sensor is to provide a technology and a solution that is easier to develop than the older technology. And so inductive position sensors has taken a look at magnetic based solutions and said, hey, we can do it a better way. And inductive position sensors, the big benefits are that they are more accurate. They have really good noise immunity to stray magnetic fields. And we'll talk more about that. And um, they also don't require magnets at all. In fact, if you look at what a inductive position sensor is, the sensor is traces on a PCB board. And the target Instead of being a magnet, and that's how Hall effect sensors work, the target is just a piece of metal, a piece of metal moving over the PCB board. In fact, on one of the slides that will show up, you can see actually two examples of this. One is a rotary sensor off on the left, and one is a linear sensor off on the right. And the traces, once I said, are the sensor. We have ICs, microchips ICs, that we have that are exciting that sensor, reading the information back, and calculating the position for higher accuracy, you know, better noise immunity, and lower cost. And what we do is microchip, you know, we want to sell you the ICs. We will help you with those PCB layouts. Now, this solution has a new IC in it, right? Can you talk about that a bit? Oh, yeah. So we've taken our portfolio, and originally we were focusing on actuators, and we've expanded that to include high-speed motor control. And we have a new IC that has just come out called the LX34070, and it's focused now on high-speed motor control, and specifically, a couple of the older technologies that it replaces are magnetic resolvers and LV transducers. And you can see really on this slide, it shows the real benefits of this, why it's lower weight or smaller size and lower cost, is that these magnetic resolvers and LVD transducers, they have a lot of magnetic windings there. It's a fairly large metal structure and there's transformer windings. And we've taken all of those windings and we've put them onto a PCB tray, on the PCB layout. So a much lighter weight solutions. It also is really flexible in its application. We can have end of shaft solutions. We can have what we call arc sensor, side of shaft solutions, or through hole shaft solutions. So it's really improving these older technologies. Excellent. Now, Mark, what kind of applications would these inductive position sensors be a good fit for? One of them, as we've said before, anywhere that you've in the past thought about using Hall effect sensors is a simple question, that, or a simple answer to that. The other one, of course, is anywhere that you are doing and you need accurate rotary 
or linear position detection. And there's a whole range of those types of applications. And in the industrial area, some of the examples could be a linear motor position. You know, you have a moving up and down a track and you want to know the, the precise location of that motor. Robust user controls where you may have a lot of liquid or dust or even metal shavings in an area and you need to worry about ensuring that the user control always has precise control. Or you're in a really high magnetic field environment and you need to make sure that that motor or that industrial machine is not going to be messed up. The sensor you need to be is very accurate there. Uh, vending machines is another one. And of course, robot control. Robot control has lots of axis of rotation. Rotation. Each one of those axis of rotation is a place for an inductive position sensor. Now, I have also heard about these kind of sensors in automotive designs, and they can be in a lot of different locations within a vehicle, right? Yeah, exactly. In fact, there was a report recently that came out and inside a car, there's somewhere on the order of 50 to 60 different magnet-based sensors currently. And so a lot of those are Hall effect sensors because that's been the predominant technology. But there are lots of applications that we can use with inductive position sensors. Inductive position sensors have been in cars. If you're driving around with an accelerator pedal, the chances are inside that pedal is an inductive position sensor. But uh, this chart here shows a lot of other applications. We've been focused on safety critical, high temperature applications where it's really important to have those benefits I mentioned before. Good accuracy, really immune to stray magnetic fields, and then being able to not have to worry about sourcing magnets. And so some of the other ones besides pedals would be motor control we talked about. Uh, they're inside automobiles today. There's a lot of electric motors now that are replacing hydraulic motors. So your main e-motor or maybe a motor that powers your brakes or your power steering motor, those can all have inductive sensors, transmission gears, gear shifts. These are just a few of them. And this chart is just a few of them, but we have many more um, that can go inside cars and, of course, industrial applications too. So how do these microchip inductive sensors compare with all sensors? Right. And really, they can be more accurate. And I wanted to kind of point out why this is. One is accuracy. The other one, of course, is noise immunity. And then, of course, we don't need a magnet. And let's talk about each one of those and why. The reason the accuracy is pretty apparent is that with inductive sensors, there's very low temperature drift going on. So in a magnet-based solution, that magnetics property will change quite a bit over temperature. In an inductive position sensor, the algorithm is independent of temperature. As a result, we can be very stable over temperature. So that's one great. The other one is that we can actively reject stray magnetic fields. A magnet nearby our solution or putting it right next to a motor is not going to have an impact on that solution. Even though there's a magnetic field that's moving in that area, we can reject those other stray magnetic fields and only be interested in the field that we are exciting our sensor with. And that's a huge advantage for electric vehicles or anywhere that we need to put a sensor right next to a motor or a high current environment where there's a strong magnetic fields. The other one is that we don't need a magnet there. And so the magnet has cost associated with it. As I mentioned before, the sensor itself is PCB board traces. So the PCB board will be bigger because that is part of the sensor. We've replaced that magnet and replaced it with PCB board material, and that's much cheaper than a magnetic material. So those are some of the advantages over Hall Effect Sensor. You know, to help customers and people with this technology, we have a whole source of reference designs that we have available on our web and for purchase. And then we also can help customers with the custom designs, too, if they come to us. Fantastic. Now, what kind of options do I have within this inductive sensor family? So our new device, our LX34070, as I mentioned before, expanded our capabilities into motor control. And so if I wanted to look at our portfolio, you kind of divide it under motor control side, and then we have kind of what I call human interface or power assist 
or our actuator side. And the reason for that is the speed associated with it. You need to be making choices and decisions on position like at a 20 kilohertz rate because most motor controls are switching around that frequency. Some go a little higher, but most are just above the audio range. And that's why you need fast decision making. And our sensors like the 34070 can provide those signals at that level. Then at slower speed, like human interface applications, then you're going to be looking at the one to two kilohertz range. And that's where a couple of our devices called the LX3301A or the LX3302A are for lower speed. So that's one. That's kind of the application. Are you motor control or are you human or power assist type applications? Another thing you look at is the temperature range. And a lot of our ICs are kind of at the highest grade temperature range for industrial, much even industrial and automotive, and that's grade zero for automotive, going all the way up to 150 degrees C. One of our ICs, a 3301A, is also for lower temperature. So if you don't need to get up there, maybe the 3301A is appropriate for you. And then the other one is often sensors are always connected to some sort of host processor or host microcontroller. And maybe that application already has an interface that you need. Maybe they want an analog input or a PWM input. Or maybe if it's in the automotive range, they want a SENT interface or a PSI-5 interface. And so that's another way of choosing which of these devices go on. I do want to point out that in the new chip, it will actually output sine and cosine signals. And as I mentioned before, you know, this is replacing older magnetic resolvers, LVD transducers, and those technologies output sine and cosine signals. And the 34070 does the same thing. It also adds differential capability, so it will do differential sine and cosine signals. But let me also point out that you can still do single-ended measurements if you need to, and that's just a question that comes up often. So... Hopefully that is good, and that's our portfolio that has been expanded recently with our new device. Makes sense. Now, Mark, motor control measurement is an important aspect of these kind of sensors, right? What does that look like in this case? Yeah, you know, for all the sensors, you want to try how accurate can you be? And in motor control, we're often are working with absolute position sensors over 360 degrees, or in motor control, we can take advantage of the symmetry of the motor, and maybe we only need to measure a 90 degrees and then have it repeat over 360 mechanical degrees. And our inductive position sensors are quite accurate very accurate for these motor control applications. In the range that we've done with our evaluation board that we have available that you can use for the 34070 is a four pole pair device. It measures 90 mechanical degrees and we can have an error that is on the order of plus or minus 0.1 degree mechanical. And if you translate that into electrical angle, it's around 0.4 to 0.5 degrees electrical. So that's the type of accuracy measurements that you can do with one of our new ICs called the 34070. Our, for actuator positions, you can also, accuracy is really important, and we have quite a bit of collateral and we have calibration points inside our ICs to help reduce the error over the operating range that you're working to, with that particular sensor. So what about the noise immunity? I know that these kind of sensors can be really powerful when it comes to noise rejection. Yeah, and a big benefit of inductive, why it's so good to noise immunity is it has an active noise rejection. So inside our IC, we have what's called a synchronous demodulator. And a synchronous demodulator is we're exciting a magnetic field at a given frequency and then we receive the signals in and we can filter out all other frequencies. This is much like an AM radio does. Your antenna picks up the whole AM spectrum, but when you dial in on your dashboard to a particular channel, it's just looking at the channel that you're interested in. We're doing the same thing. And as a result, we can reject stray magnetic fields. We're doing this excitation at between 4 and 6 megahertz, well above the frequency range that you would see other types of magnetic fields in an industrial or automotive environment. 
you're dealing with you know switching frequencies of power devices in the 20 kilohertz or maybe 50 kilohertz or maybe 100 kilohertz range well below the excitation area that we're doing in addition to active rejection we also have passive rejection too and as a result this is just one extra step that just keeps it so that when you are putting these in high magnetic field environments, they just are not susceptible to these stray magnetic fields. There are particular standards out there that people will test sensors in these magnetic field environments, and we can get to the highest level standards or above, and we're still seeing no impact on our sensors in these magnetic field environments. And so great performance. And the real secret is that we're doing active noise rejection. Can we step back? Can you explain a bit about how inductive sensors work? Sure. It's pretty simple. How does it work is that we talked about we aren't using magnets. You know, this is not magnets. So the sensor is detecting the position of a piece of metal. But we do need to generate a magnetic field. And we do that by exciting a winding that's on the PCB board, much like the primary of a transformer. You excite the primary of the transformer, and it generates a magnetic field. We have two receive coils that are positioned at different locations that are picking up the voltage from that primary winding. It's almost like an air core transformer at this stage. Then we put a piece of metal nearby, and that's our target, okay? And that, when a linear movement would be moving over that magnetic field, and also a rotary sensor, that target is moving over that magnetic field. And as that target moves, or even as it's placed over that magnetic field, it disturbs that magnetic field. You know, due to laws of physics, you end up having, as you get eddy currents that flow on that piece of metal, and those, those eddy currents that are flowing actually in a circle, they will actually generate also a magnetic field. It's like we generate a magnetic field, the target generates a magnetic field, but it generates a field to, to cancel out everything. So wherever the simple explanation is, wherever that target is, the magnetic field has dropped to zero. And as a result, the two receive coils that are different geometric locations will detect different voltages. And we take the ratio of those two voltages, and that ratio is a one-to-one -one relationship with the position of the target. And that's the simple explanation. There is a few other things that go on, but really at a high level, this is what we're doing to make the inductive sensors work. To show you an example of a 360 degree sensor just to kind of show how all this fits together and on the screen here you can see traces from the primary winding and our two receive coil windings there is actually and you can think of this there's a target and the target is this gray piece of metal that would be attached maybe to a shaft that's running through the board in this example and when i press the play button on this solution, you can see that that target is moving 360 degree, and it's at this stage, it's generating different voltages. And so we're detecting how that target is moving in a rotary solution. And that's an example there. Okay. So Mark, if my audience is interested in trying out one of these sensors, do you guys have any kits to get them started? Yeah, our focus is how do we make sensor development as easy and straightforward as possible and using newer technologies, replacing some older ones to take advantage of these advantages and benefits I pointed out. We have pro kits, but I really like our nano kits that have come out. We have a couple of nano kits. One is a 50 millimeter long linear sensor as one kit, and another one is a 180 degree rotary sensor kit. They're priced really well. They integrate with our integrated software, which is called IPC software. And in addition, they can do really many of the things our ProKit can do to get you started with the technology. In addition to that, on board these boards are little microcontrollers that are interfacing with the sensor. And we're using this microcontroller to interface with the sensor to do the programming, to read the sensor output, to integrate with our software on the computer. After you get things all set up, you could repurpose that microcontroller to do something else in your system. So it's a great little kit to get started with the technology. 
in addition to nano kits, we have a whole bunch of other evaluation boards that are in different formats, standalone format, and we have a series of evaluation boards that have what's called the micro bus on it. This particular bus structure is available on a lot of our curiosity evaluation boards. And these evaluation boards would have like a, a microcontroller with some ADCs and connection with the computer. And so now in this type of solution, you can take these evaluation boards, plug them on, and now you almost have a plug and play rapid prototype type of a scenario where you can quickly get up and look and check out, start utilizing the signals in your solution. So do you guys have a specific kit for the LX34070? Yes, we do. And it's available on our website. There are available and this as the evaluation board. There is a programmer that comes with it, our LXM9518 programmer, along with the cables that you need for the solution. The software is available on our website. The programmer is the same programmer that we use on our pro kit. So if you already had one of those, you can reuse that and then the cables that come with the kit too. So you can also just buy the evaluation board too. But this is available so you can try out our new 34070 device for motor control. Excellent. Now, do you guys have any other assets that could get my audience started with their next design? Yeah, I'm really proud of this next option for it. You can buy evaluation boards, and these are super great. There are a lot of do-it-yourself people that, hey, just want to look at the PCB trace. They want to look at the layout. They want an example of putting it on their board right away. We have an option where you can download sensor designs right from our website. And there are eight of the designs right now up there, and you can download these. They range from rotary sensors, 180 degree, 360 degree, to linear sensors, all the way up that range from somewhere on the order of 50 millimeters up to 200 millimeters. And these are plug and play design solutions. You download the layout, you can put it into your project on your PCB board. You can order a particular variant of the LX3302A QPW. Now the 3302A, I mentioned it before, it has custom calibration capability in it. The Dash Easy version of this IC is specifically designed for these particular sensors. So you just can order that part with that already pre-programmed. You can put it on the board and now you have a design. There's no calibration. You don't have to read the data sheet. You just have to plug your microcontroller into one of the outputs that's listed on the layout, either analog output, PWM output, or scent output, and you can start reading information right from the sensor. Great way to get started. You can also look at how the traces are so that you could scale these designs to make them a little bit bigger if you need to. You can copy and do a simple scaling or give you an idea to come to us so we can help you with some custom designs. So these are available, and it's a great source for you to get started with it. Excellent. Now, what steps would you recommend taking for my audience to get started with their next design? The best place is to go to our design center right on our website. This design center really outlines all of the pro kits, the nano kits, the evaluation boards that are available. It has our software. It has those solutions that you can download. It will have links to all our devices. And there's also videos on there to help you get started with any of the software in really each step of the way as you are trying out the technology. In addition to that, if you are looking at the designs and the evaluation board and these downloadable designs and you're saying, my particular application does need a little bit different than what's available here. I encourage you also to reach out to Microchip and we can help with you know, modifying or giving you a custom PCB layout that would interface with RACs for your particular application. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mark. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.